Hey, welcome to tonight's live stream. Thank you for being on and uh, we're gonna have some fun on this one. Definitely geeking out on some of the subtleties but important aspects of music theory. And of course, if you're part of the replay crew, let me know where you're coming from and uh, let's jump right in. So uh, last week, Denidri mentioned something which was important to address. And I've talked a bit about the, the shape pattern used with color music. Uh, last week we talked about the value and benefit of using color, uh, but there's definitely something about the shapes that is really important. And I talk about it in some videos and definitely talk about it in the course and explain this in detail, but we're gonna talk through these shapes and experience life with and without the shapes. A little bit like George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life when he, <laughs> he finds out what it was like to not have lived what the world would be like let's see what the world of music theory would be like without the use of shapes so uh to show you what i mean um we're gonna this is just like a summary image and we're gonna come back to this and it'll make even more sense once we've walked through it but here are one two three four five different takes on symbol sets to communicate notes and intervals. Notes and intervals at the atomic level are the most important aspects of music. And so we're going to look at each of these and see what what value they have, how much communication they, how much information they convey, and uh, which one is the winner. And uh, spoiler alert, this one is definitely the winner, uh, the colors and the shapes. But let's get into it. And we're going to start with uh, the symbol, the symbols that we all have enjoyed <laughs> being introduced to the world of music theory with, which are traditional finger charts, like we have here, and traditional notation, like we have here. Now, something that is similar between the two of them is that they both use uniform black dots to represent otherwise invisible notes. So in this E minor chord, for example, the, the numbers here just represent which fingers to, to use, and these mean they're open strings. Uh, we have a C major chord, so it's a one, a, a second finger, and a third finger. These are open strings. And so it's just straight up monkey see, monkey do. Pressure finger here. There's no further explanation of how the notes relate, what the notes specifically are, unless you've memorized what those notes are and so on for all of the other chords. And likewise for music notation, you have to know what note is what within the context of the staff lines. If the staff lines evaporated and we only had these black dots, we would lose our bearings. We wouldn't have any sense of which pitch is which because every pitch is pitch black, uniform black dots that don't convey meaning on their own. They only derive meaning within the context of the staff lines. Uh, so, uh, shared among these different diagrams are the common appearance of Braille. They look more like Braille than actual photographic images. Last week we talked about, you know, the stick figure versus the photograph, that the color definitely conveyed a lot of information. And yes, if we used color and color alone, there would be more, more meaning to what we're looking at here. But we're going to get into the shapes and why the shapes are beneficial as well. Uh, but you can see here already that uniform shapes, just like uniform colors, ain't ain't helping us much. So let's let's go a little further on this. So, um, for those of you who are new to this, super quick, just high level look at how the the colors are even applied is that the chromatic scale by picking out tetrachords or major scale patterns from the chromatic scale. Together they form an overlapping ring or a daisy chain pattern of major scales where every fifth note is uh, starts its own key or its own scale. And so if we condense this pattern into just the fifths, we have a circle of fifths, which is also a color wheel. And then if we rotate every other note back into the chromatic scale, we have the notes as they're actually played in music, like on a piano keyboard. but with the colors baked in. So you can see, for example, that C, red, is closely related to G, red, orange, and F, purple, red, 
and so on. Because music is cyclical and symmetrical, these same color relationships highlight those harmonic relationships between notes. Now, if, and we're gonna get into this more, but if all of these notes were circles, for example, just like we saw in those finger charts where there were black dots, if all of these were circles, then this rotation of taking every other note or tritones, one set of notes that are uh, whole steps, separated by whole steps, and we rotate that 180 degrees to get to the circle of fifths or the chromatic scale one way or the other, it would be a lot harder to see to pick out which set of whole steps to rotate because if they were all circles, they'd all be circles. You, you, it, it would be visually less distinct what set of whole steps we're looking at because they'd all bleed into each other visually. So the, uh, the shapes are definitely helpful and that's kind of an overview of at least making the connection between two fundamental patterns, the circle of fists and the chromatic scale, how shapes, even just in terms of the rotation of tritones, nice to see the shapes, but there's more to it than that. So let's uh, just look at this high level look of what the colors and shapes are communicating. The colors are communicating specific notes better than the letters themselves. Because let's say, for example, we have C, F, and G. Well, you can see with the colors that C red is closely related to F, purple red, and G red orange. Much more intuitively and visually immediate than, say, the letters. C, F, and G. Thinking about the letters alone, you'd have to come up with some rote mnemonic to make some kind of association. You'd have to add a layer of thinking to understand that relationship. So C, C is like, uh, you know, coffee and F is on Friday and G is great. So it's great to have coffee on Friday, like just some random mnemonic, right? It's great to have coffee every day, but that is, you know, that highlights the fact that letters aren't great for the purpose of identifying specific notes. The colors highlight those relationships in a way that letters couldn't. Likewise, the intervals between notes are highlighted also by the, the colors because you can see that these, and we're just gonna stick with C, F, and G, for example, but of course the same idea is applied to every key. And we're just focusing on fourths and fifths because it was it's super easy to, to see because the these notes are all neighbors in the circle of fifths. So it's easy to see that relationship. Um, but the intervals, uh, the colors highlight those intervals better than the numbers. Because again, if we just, if we, instead of uh, letters here, and we're in the key of C, let's say that we have one interval one, interval four, and interval five. Well, just like coffee is great on Friday, we're trying to think of, okay, one, four, and five. So five minus four equals one. It's like, no, we're trying to apply a uh, numeric, we're trying to, in this example, we're trying to apply numeric meaning that is not meant to be conveyed by scale degrees. Uh, partly because the scale degrees, you know, if you look at all the intervals in the, key of C, for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you can see that there's a whole step and a whole step and then a half step. So not all integers, if we use the term integers on, on this musical pattern are evenly spaced. Whereas in music on a number line, every integer is evenly spaced. But in music, the same distance between numbers isn't consistent. It actually doesn't follow the regular patterns and logic of math or of, of those numbers. So these intervals, like if we're, if we're relying on numbers to see, okay, there's a whole step between these two numbers, and then there's a whole step between these two numbers, and then there's a half step between these two numbers, the numbers right there break down because 
two and three is the same distance between three and four numerically, but not in music. We have a half step here. We have a whole step there. And the shapes show this interval that this is a whole step and this is a half step. From square to square is a whole step and from square to circle is a half step. So right there, the shapes highlight that they are more informative, more valuable than the numbers alone. So we have one set of symbols, one circle um, or cycle of colored shapes. I'm just getting back to this clean diagram here. We have one streamlined interface to both notes and intervals. Whereas with letters and numbers, we'd have to have C and one, you know, D and two, E and three. We're having, that's no, supposed to be three. We have to overlay these incongruous alphanumeric symbols that are not intuitive. Whereas with the colors, we have, you know, C is red. And you can see right away that it's related to F, purple, red, and G, red, orange. Again, I'm focusing on that interval of, you know, perfect fourths and fifths because it jumps out. But all of the uh, intervals between notes are symmetrical and consistent and geometric. And so, uh, again, this is just to highlight the value of shapes. And so if we were to, uh, I'm going to come back to this diagram with only circles, but you can see that the shapes really help to clarify those, uh, those intervals and those relationships uh, a lot. But this next diagram shows um, basically what the shapes even mean. So kind of talked about it a bit in terms of the shapes, the alternating squares and circles, uh, two, uh, two squares or just every other note from square to square to square to square, those are whole steps. And from circle to circle to circle to circle, those are two, uh, th that's a set of, of uh, whole steps as well. So in music, there are two sets of whole steps, squares and circles. And if you go from circle to square, square to circle, circle to square and so on, alternating back and forth between those two shapes, those are half steps. So we have whole steps and half steps. Whole, this is a W, is from square to square or from circle to circle. And then half steps are from one shape to the other right next to each other. So um, the reason that's important is because intervals are foundational to music. Music is intervals. Um, as <laughs> It's funny, I was going to say um, as Claude Deb Debussy said, but in my mind, I was going to say, as Ricky Gervais said, because if you've ever seen Claude Debussy and Ricky Gervais, like pictures of them side by side, they are the same person, like time traveling the same person. But anyways, Claude Debussy said music is the space between the notes, and he meant the intervals, that it's really about the intervals. So if there's anything you're going to want to emphasize in music and visually make distinct and clear, it would be the intervals. And that's what the shapes do, is they highlight the two most fundamental intervals. Now, of course, music is made up of patterns that are more than just whole steps and half steps, but it's combinations of those two types of intervals, whole steps and half steps that make the major scale, for example. So if we have C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, it's made from whole steps and uh, half steps. So we have whole, whole, and then there's a half, whole, 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 half. That is the, the formula, the interval formula for the major scale. And you can see right there that instead of relying on numbers to say this is, you know, from three to four is a half step, that's not intuitive. You can see right there that from one shape to the other is a half step. And from one shape to the same shape is a whole step and so on. So uh, that highlights more of the value of the shapes. And if we come here, this is showing the same thing, but now with color applied. So we have, uh, you know, the chromatic scale, for example. Um, and the chromatic scale, again, is just a rearrangement of the circle of fifths. That's why it looks like a scrambled color pattern. But focusing on the shapes, you can see that 
here you can see, you know, all of the whole steps that every other note is a whole step. So if we have C, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, and C, we have a set of whole steps. Now, if we reduced everything to uniform shapes, like all of these circles, it becomes, it kind of starts to play tricks on your eyes. At least it does on my eyes where I'm like, okay, this is a C, D, like I can feel my muscles tighten <laughs> as I'm trying to like, okay, there's a whole step, a whole step. And, and now I'm starting to count more than just at a glance, just the, the shapes are like guiding my hand, guiding my eyes and my mind. Whereas with the shapes, I'm having to like clench my jaw and okay, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Okay, that's that's the difference uh, or that's the spacing. Also, um, what we have here is C is closely related to F and G. I'm just going to keep hitting this example because, you know, it's an easy one. So C, red, is harmonically related to F, purple, red, and G, red, orange. So we have C... Those are all related. Now, if I tried to pick those out with C, hmm, I might start to lose my bearings. And if I, if if the color isn't registering with my eyeball immediately, I'm like, holy cow, this red orange looks an awful lot like red. So now I'm like, wait, is this is this C? Is this G? Now the black and white of the keyboard helps me have my bearings because I know the black and white pattern, the topography of the keyboard is helping to like guide my, my sense of where each pitch is. But if I didn't have that, like for example, on a guitar where we don't have black and white keys, you're, you're more immediately lost. So the shapes really do help in identifying or making, uh, distinguishing each pitch from the other. So this is clearly C because it's a, a square. This is clearly G because it's a circle. And those two notes being so closely harmonically related need an extra little thing to make them more distinct. And the shapes do that. Uh, so let's go on to the next diagram. Now, in the course, I think this is from lesson four, we dissect the geometry of the different interval patterns at length. Um, and this just shows, you know, some of, some of the interesting uh, patterns like you have uh, perfect tertian intervals of major thirds, uh, that there's two sets of perfect intervals of major thirds within one set of whole steps. Um, also, you have a set of tritones or polar opposites, complementary colors. Uh, in music, we call them, or sorry, in color, we call them complementary colors. In music, we call them tritones. They're just two languages that describe the same thing. And in uh, the other set of whole steps, it's the same pattern. You know, we have two triangles of tritones. We have two asterisks, if you will, of, or sorry, of, of major thirds, tri triangles of major thirds and asterisks of tritones is what I meant to say. Um, and you can see that, you know, the same patterns apply to squares as they do to circles. But, oh, and, and uh, this is another uh, diagram that kind of breaks that down even further in terms of you know, whole steps form hexagons, major thirds form triangles, uh, tritones form asterisks, and then we have, you know, a square of minor thirds and a star, you know, of, of perfect fifths and all of that. Now, if we were to just reduce uh, this pitch space circle of squares and circles into a ring of circles alone, again, it becomes more difficult to distinguish each note from the others. So we looked at this on the keyboard, but again, C looks an awful lot like G. Likewise, G looks an awful lot like D. And so if, if I lose my bearings, you know, A looks an awful lot like E. And so because color highlights those harmonic relationships and those those two notes should be similar looking because they're they're overlapping patterns in the circle of fifths but they are distinct so it's helpful to keep that distinction clear by having you know e clearly is a square and a is clearly 
a circle. And so you're not going to for you know get lost and think that this is an E and this is an A uh, once you understand the the note to uh, to color association. Um, all right, let's look even further then at this pattern. So coming back to this pattern, um, these these sets that we looked at, we already talked about how letters are not conducive to really seeing musical patterns. One, because letters are inherently linear. Uh, and by that, I mean the alphabet goes from A to Z. You don't naturally, after Z, loop back around to A. You could sing the song again, the alphabet song, but it would be, there's definitely a, a jump cut, you know, from Z back to A. Whereas in music, in the circle of fifths or in the chromatic scale, C, if we start at C, for example, we eventually cycle back to C again naturally. It's not a jump cut. It's not this awkward thing. It, it, it's natural. The same also applies to, to numbers. Um, you know, a number line is by definition linear. And so you could count from one to infinity and keep going. It doesn't necessarily cycle back on itself as music does with the different pitches. But looking at the letters here, the letters, while they help distinguish each pitch, C is C and G is G, those letters help distinguish, the relationships between the letters are not clear. Okay, so let's look at instead the traditional uh, symbols of music notation in finger charts. Uh, music notation, to be fair, they're ovals. <laughs> it doesn't really matter because they're, they're circles, right? So um, we're just going to use perfect circles. Um, these, well, these are definitely not useful because there's no context. We would need to have staff lines, uh, the staff lines and spaces of say the treble staff or the bass staff to give context, enough context for these dots to inherit meaning from, from the grand staff. Here, they don't mean anything. Um, also, unlike the letters, they don't even, they don't even distinguish any, I mean, they all look the same. So let's not too, spend too much time on that uh, because they're not helpful. So let's look at, uh, let's say we use the, the pattern of a keyboard. So these are just kind of an abstraction of, you know, the, the two black keys of the keyboard, three black keys. So we start at C and we do, you know, C, D, E, F, because whole, whole, half, and then whole to G, whole to A, whole to B, and half to C. Whole half just meaning whole step, half step intervals. So this pattern helps to distinguish each pitch. And that's what's brilliant about the topography of the keyboard, the black and white pattern, is it, it does help to visually distinguish notes from one another without having to rely on letters. Because we, we can know that, for example, um, this is a C because of its relative position to the other notes in that pattern. But it's only one step better than traditional notation in the sense that each black dot in traditional notation only derives its meaning and identity within the larger context of the staff lines. The same is true for each of these black and white notes on a keyboard. If we just plucked this white square out and looked at it in isolation, it loses its meaning because you don't have the other, you know, black and white keys to say, oh, that's C in the context of that pattern. So it's helpful in that it's better than just uniform black dots, uh, but the same general idea applies, which is context is needed for each individual pitch to have identity. And that's a problem. Um, it also, uh, this black and white pattern also, you know, if we have these black notes, it makes you kind of focus on the black notes versus the white notes and your eye gets drawn to patterns that don't really matter. And by that, I mean, these patterns kind of throw off the visual understanding of the geometry of music and those cyclical symmetrical relationships between keys. So you start to give more weight to black keys. What does the black key mean? That's, it's an accidental note. Oh, that must mean something. Accidental is more difficult or more nuanced or mystical than natural white notes. No, the black and white 
really doesn't mean anything other than they help to visually and tactically, uh, tacti tactically, I guess is the word, uh, distinguish each note on keyboard. Okay, so that's black and white on a keyboard. So we're visually getting a little better than black dots, but not enough. So if we apply color, we at least have the color to distinguish each note. So now we have C is red, and this is a C red because we're it's a it's an octave, a chromatic octave uh, from C to C. And we have D is orange. Okay, well, so we can kind of see that. You know, E is clearly distinct from from C. Red and yellow are clearly distinct. And going down the line, the same idea applies to all of them. But again, we come to the issue of uh, we can start to mistake uh, certain notes for others. So we could pluck this C out or this red circle and look at it in isolation. And if we looked at it close enough, we could see, okay, it's not red, orange, it's not G, or it's not purple, red, it's not F, that's C. But there's still some thinking and some, some visual distinction to make that is milliseconds off your life and milliseconds off your musical thinking uh, process. And it's all about trimming the uh, extraneous waste of time in terms of thinking in life and certainly when it comes to music theory. So um, by adding just the alternating shapes of squares and circles, we, we get clear distinction between each note. So we could pluck this note out and look at it in isolation. And we know that's a G. It's a red orange circle, G. Or we could look at this red square, look at it in isolation. We don't need the other notes to give it context and meaning. It has an identity in and of itself. Unlike traditional notation, unlike the topography of the keyboard, and better than at least the, the uniform shapes of color, we have the, the shape adds just enough visual meaning to make that distinction and to clarify the relationships and really highlight the geometric symmetry which is at play. And the geometric symmetry definitely uh, is, is possible and really starts to jump out way more obviously than these, that these don't even count. <laughs> They're so bad. It's the worst, it's the worst user interface ever. Um, and definitely better than the black and white keyboard and subtly but powerfully more, uh, more clearly than the uniform shapes. Um, so, I had some images to break down, you know, each one on its own, but you get the idea. Um, so if we look at all of them together, uh, this is the winner, not subjectively, but based on everything we just walked through in terms of the logic of visual processing. Last week, we talked about how visual, not all visual systems are created equal, how uh, an image can be mentally processed 60,000 times faster than text. So that means that this is, this is not the winner, just by definition, um, based on that research alone. Um, and for the reasons that we talked about with uh, understanding intervals, whole steps and half steps, the identity of each pitch, the harmonic relationships, there's a lot of uh, understanding that comes into play with, with, musical patterns. And it, and we're just talking about the chromatic scale here, just <laughs> distinguishing notes in the chromatic scale, which is the mother of all note patterns, but not even a pattern that we play. Then when I talk about geometry of music, it's more than just pretty sy symmetrical lines and diagrams. That symmetry, that geometry of music informs everything that flows from these patterns, including scales, modes, chords, and progressions. So you, you don't want to build your house upon sand, as the saying goes. You want to have a solid foundation, have, have solid symbols uh, to work with. And from that, everything can build and not collapse. Uh, if you build upon this, this is sand. If you build upon this, this is sand. This is ultimately sand. And this is shaky ground. This is solid bedrock in terms of symbol sets and understanding the patterns that flow. Um, so, uh, okay, last couple of diagrams here is, you know, if we, if we look at some chords, this, you know, you have to just memorize the notes. Like you could try to understand, you know, that this is an A note, this is an E note, this is a C sharp note, we've got an E, an A, and an E, but 
that would come from a lot of study and memorization and understanding outside of just looking at this diagram. That's it, it's not jumping out at you. If we look at the same with the shapes, this is clearly an A, this is an E. Oh, that's cool. The colored shape makes it easy to see that those are all different pitches of an E note. This is another A, A, you know, so we've got E, E, and then this is a C sharp. So you can see the constituent notes in this pattern, which are A, C sharp, and E, which make an A major chord. If we looked at the same thing with just, just the, uh, the, the colors without the benefit of the shapes, you can see, ah, that A, okay, yeah, I can tell they're different. If the light is just right, and if my vision is, is solid, um, and if I give it those extra milliseconds or multiseconds to even think it through, you're like, okay, that's distinct from this, but they're similar enough. I'll get rid of the line so you can see it yourself. They're similar enough that you almost have to do a double take like, oh, wait, okay, that, okay, those notes are distinct. Whereas with uh, the shapes, you can see the shapes, you can see the colors, and you can see what notes are what to make that chord. Um, I think that might be my last diagram. Oh, so just to wrap it up, uh, the colors and the shapes convey the two most important things in music at the most foundational level, which are notes and intervals. Better than letters or the other symbol sets and better than numbers or the other symbol sets, all in one streamlined, integrated interface. Uh, so that is the subtle power of shapes in music theory. Okay, so um, Rodney, uh, which of these two ideas did you develop first? That's a great question. Um, so the first one was the color. Um, and the, the color I had been playing around with two, a two-tone uh, system, as it were, of red and green, because I had noticed the importance of whole steps and half steps and the connection between the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale through that 180 degree rotation. Um, and, but the two, the two tone system, just like black and white on the keyboard, while it was better than the black and white in that it was every other note, red and green, uh, to at least hint at the geometry of music, the, the two tones weren't, uh, doing it. And so, uh, the color was a natural connection because of that circle of fifths to chromatic scale rotation. Um, but, and I, and for a while, actually, I did have just uniform shapes. And so if I look at my old diagrams, it is uniform shapes. And it really was, it was those milliseconds lost of what is that? What am I looking at? And so the shapes came second. It's a good question. Thank you for that question. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, cool. So um, the best part of, of music theory is when it all starts to make sense. <laughs> and it can, it can be, you know, it can seem like a lot. And that was, I, I like jumped into the deep end with music theory and found it was um, difficult to uh, make sense of everything. But once you lay that foundation, like I'm talking about with the fundamental relationships between notes and intervals, and then build upon that solid foundation, it's like so satisfying to have it make sense. So Delta 4, 12, 12, I know music theory forward and backwards, but this makes no sense whatsoever. Um, that, I would be interested to know how you studied music. Um, I have talked with various people who have studied through traditional notation, um, which is, and if traditional notation is your route or finger diagrams, traditional chord charts, um, you know, use what works well for you. But if this doesn't make sense, I don't know how well you know music theory, frankly, because this is music theory. Music theory means to see sound. And if this doesn't make sense, it, it may be that you, you could learn some more. Um, okay, so Rudolf Petrus, all of what we see makes tons of sense in Mike's color wheel showing all keys in the relative notes in each scale. Cool, I'm glad that that is helpful. And Dolph, thanks for your feedback. I'm glad it makes sense. You know. Uh, visual systems are varied, like like we showed here. Some use uniform black dots, 
Others use numbers and letters alone. Others focus on uh, just patterns because music is patterns. And, you know, there, there are different, I have from back in the day, some finger and chord charts, scale, scale diagrams that show different patterns um, to learn, you know, harmonic minor scale or, you know, melodic minor scale or all sorts of different patterns. Um, but understanding at the constituent atomic level, what those notes and intervals mean really is it's, it's you have to dig deeper to get there to understand and uh you know if if you're used to just playing patterns and getting those quick results which is satisfying honestly you know to be to be fair it is satisfying to strum a chord you know strum a c strum you know g go to a d come back to g without having to, to think about it that is satisfying but it's the short-term gain for the long-term loss in, in terms of understanding music theory and being able to build on that, especially when it comes to writing your own songs. Um, okay, so many vibes, dude, your Christmas tree and Walt, Walt told me to tell you uh, they would like to be color too. I like it. So we do need some, some color on there. And uh, actually I, I do have some, some color shape ornaments on another Christmas tree that uh, is, super geeking out <laughs> with color music. I just don't have them on this one, but I should. I went with the more more dignified or subtle, uh, what do you call this, tinsel? But yeah, I love it. Thank you, Many Vibes. Uh, we, should, we should do some more decorations with these. Um, all right, so uh, Virtuous Heretic, we will have ornaments next week. All right, that's a promise. We're gonna, we're gonna add some, some ornaments to this tree next week. So Dolph, you said notes and intervals, different shapes, different colors. The brain is key to find similarities and differences in everything we see. So this concept of shapes and colors is unique strategy. Uh, that's very well said. Dolph, you're very good with words and, and saying something concisely, uh, which I love. And, and ultimately, like how you just said that concisely is the point of this interface, this user interface, this visual system of colors and shapes. It's meant to communicate a lot of information concisely. So in the course, I use the metaphor of, um, what do you call them? Uh, barcodes, barcode scanners. And like in the, the early days of barcodes, you have you know just lines, black and white lines, and that uh, pattern represents something. And then the second generation is what we see more often, which is like the square, the white and black squares, it's, it becomes, instead of just linear or one dimensional, it becomes two dimensional. And that actually, the reason those barcodes are used like in QR codes and stuff is because you can actually communicate more data, more information is conveyed in that basically the same physical space. And then there's another next generation which uses color and different shapes to communicate even more information. So it packs a punch. You can, you, you know, you have limited real estate, whether it's physically on the page or screen or in your mind in terms of processing information. And so the more information you can convey that's relevant and useful is what it's all about. And that's why the colors and shapes are useful. Um, Anywhere Studios, hey there, late to this live, but love your videos. Hey, thanks. I'm glad you're here and uh, I'm glad they make sense and are helpful. Uh, Roland Bach, Hey, it's late slash early where you are. I know you're in Germany, and so uh, thanks for being here. Um, do you know the guitar game for know the guitar game for PC and PlayStation Rocksmith? That should be for learning guitar. Uh, what do you think about that? That's a good question. I actually don't know it, um, so I would need to look at it. I'm guessing maybe it uses colors and shapes in some way. Um, if it does, um, that would be interesting. It definitely could help in playing patterns. Um, and then as far as these particular colors and these particular patterns with the shapes follows the inherent patterns of music based on the circle of fifths, based on the chromatic scale, that underlying geometry that informs everything, uh, like I say, including scales, modes, chords, and progressions. So, um, you know, it, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, I'm guessing their colors are arbitrary. Every other system I've seen that has used color is... Um, meant to because people get it color helps um aid recognition but the key is to 
aid understanding as well when the color system is founded on underlying music theory. Um, Sir Meisenman, your videos, uh, your videos is the first time that I could really dive into the sense behind and in harmonic space. Very cool. I'm glad that makes sense. Um, and I'm so happy to hear it. Uh, you know, for, for, for this to make sense is a beautiful thing. And for me is, uh, you know, for music theory to make sense is an existential thing because music is so beautiful. It's so beyond adjectives. It's, it's such a beautiful thing. And so when I've tried to learn theory or tried to understand it, get closer to and connected with music through systems that were confusing, um, like traditional notation, traditional charts, tablature, um, it was more than a buzzkill. Like it's more than just, ah, oh, that's a bummer. I wish I could understand music. It's more important than that because music is more important than that. So to be able to really connect with it is is awesome. So thank you for your feedback. I'm, I'm glad it makes sense. All right. Well, that is um, what I wanted to cover in terms of the, the shapes and how they subtly influence. And they're really not that subtle once you see them. But once you see how they work, they definitely um, highlight more than you would think when you see the alternative uh, with just colors alone. Um, all right. So uh, another comment here. Um, uh, so Mikhail Banks, hey there, I'm wondering how your technique handles borrowed chords or multimodal chord when forming chord progressions. I really love your approach and agree it's far more useful and intuitive. Um, cool. Thanks for your feedback. So this um, chord map is um, out of focus. So this is a tool that um, I'll be using actually in the next live stream, um, which is going to be next Monday, by the way. So, uh, we'll be walking through a really cool chord progression that is enjoyable using, uh, not just the chords within a given key and mode, but, uh, you know, actually moving between, uh, modes and keys. Um, so this is, uh, just kind of a high level answer to your question in terms of how it handles borrowed chords and, and multi-mode chords. I have some videos and live streams on that. I'll be doing more as well. Much of my focus, and by much, I mean pretty much almost 100% of my focus is on getting part five of the course out. Um, so I'll be doing more, you know, produced videos with animations and all of that uh, as I get there. Um, but there are some some posts in the library um, and the link is in the, the video um, and also some videos here as well that explore this chord map to an extent, but we'll be exploring it even more coming up. Uh, okay, so, um, and then also uh, just as a heads up, so live stream next Monday and then uh, planning on, I'm planning on streaming the usual time on Christmas uh, Monday and also a New Year's Monday uh, because music doesn't stop. Even, even if it's a nice holiday. So, uh, just keep that in mind if if you want to uh, geek out with me on music theory on those days. Uh, Marco, question: It makes sense to color according to the circle of fifths, but why color C minor the same as C major? Is it because they are neighbors for modulation? What's the justification? So, um, let me make sure I understand your question. So, for example, in the key of C, C major, C Ionian. We have C, and then in Aeolian, we have C minor, which is also represented by a red square. Let me get that in focus. So, for example, we have red square, red square. One is a major chord in this inner ring, and one is a minor chord in this middle ring. Uh, what gives? Why would those both be red squares? And so, uh, Marco, if I'm restating your question, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, the gist is, is that each of these chord, uh, chord symbols represents the root note of that chord. So, you know, C major is C, E, and G, whereas C minor is C, E flat, and G. And so this chord, C major, is different than this chord, C minor. And so there's uh, individual notes that make up those chords that do differ, but the root 
is what is represented here. And I have other diagrams in the library and then also uh, more diagrams that I'm going to be uh, getting out there that I haven't published yet that really dive into that a bit more. But um, definitely check out the modes playlist that explains how uh, each of these uh, chords are formed, how they relate, uh, not only in Ionian, but in Mixolydian, in Dorian, in Aeolian, um, and how, uh, why they're arranged that way. Um, I can definitely do another live stream and, and get into more detail though, because that's a great question. Willy Nilly, can you go over the seconds and ninths? Um, seconds and ninths are in essence, if you have C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, for example, you have the second interval. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Anything within that first octave, one through eight is, or actually one through seven, they're called simple intervals. And anything above that in the next octave are compound intervals. And I have another live stream where I talk about uh, how that works, but basically one and eight are the same, two and nine are the same because they're just an octave difference, three and 10, four and 11, five and 12, six and 13, seven and 14, and then we go up to 15. So one, eight, and 15 are just octaves of the tonic using the key of C as an example. Um, all right. Oh, I'm not showing myself. I am here. Uh, many vibes. So undertones and overtones for dummies, please. That's a great question and definitely warrants more of a, uh, more of a, a discussion than, than I'll get into here because that is a great question. And those frequencies help to inform the pitches that we hear. Um, but we'll get into that, uh, another time, but I like that question and I'll, I'll speak to it. So that is all for tonight. Thank you for being here talking about uh, music theory and some really important patterns. Uh, next week, we'll get into some application of these patterns uh, with some chord progressions. So we will be uh, talking very soon. And in the meantime, I hope you have a really good one and I'll see you on the next one.